Mike Green, sitting back down in Marin County after traveling for a week or so, and I get to sit down with one of my friends, Brent Donnelly. Brent, you and I have known each other for years on the FX side. You were the head trader at HSBC on FX, particularly in the G10 area with a focus in derivatives, which obviously overlapped with my background. Um, You've now gone out on your own and you've become the head of Spectra Markets. Can you tell us a little bit about what Spectra is doing that is different than what you would have done at, say, an HSBC? Sure. So Spectra FX is a a boutique FX and FX options house. And what Spectra, Spectra FX Solutions does is essentially pair buyers and sellers in FX derivatives um, and in FX spot. And so I'm a part of that organization, but then we've also started a separate company called Spectra Markets. And that kind of goes to my strength in the past as a trader has often been about communicating um, risk management, macro. And so I write a daily that goes to a lot of people and that's kind of like my brand has become more and more about writing um, and so I have a couple of books and all that. Um, so Spectrum Markets was designed to kind of try to provide an institutional quality content to a broader base. Because working at a bank, you can't send your content outside of the, the ecosystem, which is, you know, accredited institutional investors. Whereas this organization, the idea is to write my pieces um, in, in a way that both retail and institutions can can absorb them or uh, yeah, read them. So, you, I mean, and it's interesting. So it's somewhat similar to the transition that I've had where we've seen the institutional space change in a lot of ways, in particular, this dynamic of what used to be much more broadly distributed research that was used both by the end buy side, right? So institutions like a Ontario teachers or others is increasingly less available um, outside of the bank's direct relationships, right? So unless there's a trading relationship, it becomes harder to get out. Now, you mentioned your your writing in book form. You've written two books, both of which I think are fantastic, Alpha Trading, which came out this year, and The Art of Currency Trading, which came out, I believe, in 2017, if I remember correctly. Or... Uh, 19. 19, okay. Yeah. So what possessed you to actually write books? Because that's like, I I will tell you candidly, a lot of people push me on that. My family pushes me on that. I try to push myself on that. And man, that is a serious undertaking. So yeah, the first book was kind of inspired by the fact that if you go into the currency trading category, like on Amazon or when I was younger in the library or whatever, there's essentially two kinds of books. One is international finance books which are kind of boring and theoretical and have some application to trading but barely and then so that's one end of the spectrum and the other end of the spectrum is like scalping is fun or like super awesome trade chart pattern masters or whatever like very lowbrow simplistic not usually books written by non-experts um and i felt like there was like a space in the middle where you could talk about trading in a practical way but that's not you know, that's not too dumb and not too smart. Um, So I kind of tried to do this and do it in like a a way that's not boring and that's practical. Um, And so whenever, when I was young, whenever I saw a book written by a trader, I was always very skeptical because I'd be like, you know, dude, if you're such a good trader, just like you're probably rich, why are you writing books? Like that doesn't make any, like it felt like a disconnect. Um, but the simple fact, I guess, that I learned is just I like writing. And I enjoy doing it. And honestly, I think the process is probably like for me, of course, it's fun to get like a physical copy of your own book with your name on it. And, and that's cool. But the actual um, publishing, I think I'm learning more and more is less important than the actual writing of the, the process of writing it. And then Alpha Trader is more like so with with the art of currency trading it's a book about fx trading obviously and that, so that was a pretty meaningful constraint on what i could write about whereas alpha trader is just like okay now i can write a book about trading and i can write whatever i want so i do a lot of stuff like just telling stories about like you know fun stories that happened when i was trading or like going through specific examples that aren't always fx to say like okay here's how a trade is born and here's how your risk management kind of start to finish But then like there's a bunch of things that I did, like trying to really dig deep into understanding variance versus skill um, in trading, because I think when you have a really good understanding of variance, then when you go on a losing streak, 
you don't get very emotional about it because you understand like, okay, my win rate is 50% and my up days are 1.7 times my down days. And so, you know, every year I'm going to have at least one streak of five or six losses in, in a row. And, you know, that's variance as opposed to like, okay, I, I'm not reading the market well, I'm out of sync. You know, it's important to be able to distinguish between what's variance and what isn't. And by doing some like deeper dives and simulations and stuff in the book, I think I actually enhanced my own understanding of, of what's variance and what's bad trading. And so my ability to distinguish between those two, I think was enhanced as well. But anyways, long story short, mostly I just, I like writing. Um, you know, that's always been a big part of what I love doing. And so this is like an outlet, an obvious outlet of something I'm expert at that I feel I have something to say. And I can sort of approach it in a fun way because I have a lot of stories and, and things to talk about. So, I, I mean, I also find that same dynamic that it's incredibly valuable to have the discipline of writing. I think one of the other, other overlaps that I'm seeing, I'm currently watching my oldest son learn how to program in Python and NumPy, NumPy, I'm sorry. Um, and, you know, the, the underlying dynamics of organizing your thoughts in a very logical, consistent manner that can be interpreted by somebody as simple as a computer or as complex as a global macro portfolio manager, mm. hugely, hugely valuable for yourself. Forget anyone else, right? Um, so to that point, um, I, went, I worked at a hedge fund for three years, and I had been writing my daily for many years before that. And when I went to the hedge fund... I couldn't write anymore because there's, you know, there's no end user. There's no reason to send something out. And I really noticed that it made my process a lot worse. Um, so one thing I find is when I'm writing is like, say I'm writing an idea. Okay, I'm going to be short Aussie dollar and this and that. And sometimes I, I can see as I'm writing it, okay, like this is not a good idea. This is This does not sound good. And then I'll just reboot and say, okay, like I'm now, now what kind of thing. Um, whereas when I wasn't writing, it was, it was the Eurozone crisis as well. So that kind of, um, catered to a lot of like button pushing and headline reading and stuff like that. So what would happen a lot of times I'd come in and there'd be some random headline Spain downgraded or something. And I just start hitting buttons and going short euros, for example, when, if I had constructed a plan ahead of time, more likely than not, the, the idea was probably to fade that downgrade because those downgrades were all priced in by that point. So I, I do feel like it's kind of one of the cliches of trading, I think, is like journaling has mm -hmm. value. Um, but most of the cliches are true. And I really believe in that. Um, not necessarily like so journaling after or, or and all and following your trades, but also writing your plan, um, I, I think, is really, really useful and having like laying out reassessment triggers, for example, so that you're not always getting sucked into the price action and saying like, oh, it should have gone up by now or it's not behaving the way I thought. Um, when you have firm reassessment triggers, then you have, I mean, it's just like a, right, having a plan and sticking to it. Um, and I feel like when you write something, it's concrete. And when you think something, it's very abstract and fuzzy. And so the the transmission or or whatever the process of going from thought to writing there's a there's some activity that happens in that process that filters out bad ideas and sort of substantiates the the parameters around the what are the good ideas the other thing that i've noticed and i'd be interested in your response to this is part of the difference between a newsletter writer for example and a portfolio manager who writes is the flexibility around it, right? So everything we're talking about is effectively a way of taking our hyperactive brains, slowing them down enough so that we're able to actually write out the program. We're able to say, this is our expectations on non-price related components. Give us components to check and, and review. Um, but we also, I think that's in part a reaction to exactly what you were referring to a brain that automatically wants to interpret the new information and try to reconstruct a narrative at every point in time. Whereas the newsletter world, it feels to me that it tends to get captured by, here's my thesis, here's what's going to happen, here's why it didn't happen this time, but why it's certain to happen next time, right? You know, the gold bug type dynamic or um, the Bitcoin maximalist, which we'll talk a little bit about um, in, in, in a few minutes. It, is that consistent with kind of the way that you think about it as well? Yeah, I would agree with that. So I think that's one challenge as like, 
if you're a little bit cynical about newsletters and you write a newsletter, you know, where does that put you? And I, right. I feel like that's kind of where I am. But I think the, the explanation for that, some of that, is that your incentives as a newsletter writer are to be consistent and to tell one story because it gets too confusing um, if you keep flipping all over the place. But I think your incentives as a trader are to do what works and what makes money. And, you know, if you're bearish equities and equities are going up 1% every day and 75% of all years, you're going to be bankrupt But as a trader. But as a newsletter writer, you probably won't be bankrupt because you're going to have enough people that that, um, you know, enjoy that sort of material. So I personally, part of my edge is like my sign off on my newsletter is good luck, be nimble. And I think part of my edge is that I just, if I'm wrong, I just write about it. I say, Hey, I was wrong for this reason, this reason, that reason. And people love that. So like, I don't have any, I don't know, like, I just, I don't have any problem with being wrong because I'm wrong a lot. And that is clear in in my writing. And then that makes my switching costs very low. Whereas, you know, if you've been bearish equities for six years, then the switching cost of turning bullish is massive, right? For reputation and, and, and also potentially for maybe people are just reading you because you're bearish, right? I, I know one guy who, who's very, tends to be bearish, although it's, he, anyways, he tends to be bearish. And when he turns bullish, he loses subscribers because people don't want to read that. They're, that's, right. they're subscribing for one reason. So I think my incentives are pretty aligned because like I'm trading and, and people understand that and people understand what I'm doing. So, uh, but yeah, to your point, I think one optimal strategy in marketing is just to pick a view and pound it. Um, but is that always intellectually honest? Maybe sometimes it is, but um, that's definitely definitely not consistent with someone who's trading real money because if you're trading real money and you're wrong persistently or then you, know, you just change your view or you stop out yeah I, I I tend to find that anytime I feel that I'm becoming tied to a particular view right whether that's uh, you know, markets are going up or markets are going down. Like I, I'm, that's one of the reasons why I emphasize in my public, you know, communications. I love being called the world's dumbest man, or right? the dumbest man alive. I was, you know, I, I uh, the whole story behind that. But you want to have people hate what you're saying. You want to have your regular reader say, um, you know, I can't believe you would be so stupid as to write something like this down, right? <laughs> because your your immediate response to that is. Wow, I must be doing something right if people actually hate what I just so wrote. That's really, really interesting. So when I send my piece out and I get a lot of feedback and there's a lot of value to that for me, like that the network impact of, of a lot of people responding to it. First of all, sometimes they people just point out things that you didn't realize. But then there's the other thing of the vitriol or agreement level has a lot of value for sentiment um, as a sentiment indicator. But when you send a, a newsletter to like a couple of thousand hedge fund managers and then you get a bunch of you know responses that are consistent one way or the other, I find that has a lot of value. So if I get like 20 emails saying like, dude, no, absolutely no way is this right. But they're not providing like substantive reasons that change my mind. They're just saying like, you know, maybe providing other reasons that aren't convincing or whatever. I find that's a really, really good sentiment indicator. Um, so when people, yeah, when people get angry and the other thing too, is sometimes I can feel it myself. Like I've been writing bearish crypto stuff since November 17th. And I actually wrote in the first piece, like it kind of feels mean spirited or like, like gross to be bearish crypto. Cause I know all my friends are bullish and like a lot of people are switching jobs to go into crypto and all that. And that can be another indicator too. So November 17th of this year, you're writing about crypto and you're skeptical of it. You and I have talked a little bit offline about this. What, what, what's driving your skepticism? What's, what, what makes you, or, or more accurately, are you skeptical short-term versus long-term? And is it product-based versus um, crypto, right? So right. Is, it, is it Bitcoin, Ethereum, et cetera, that you're concerned about the degree of speculation, DeFi, NFTs? Or is it, there's no way this new digital securities technology is ever going to take off and I'm going to get back into my old uh, horse and buggy and ride off into the sunset. So. Right. So that's, I think that's a really important question. And I think it's something that people are not very good at in general 
is distinguishing between cyclical and structural structural stories. So you can be bullish crypto as a structural story and and think that eventually, you know, crypto takes over the world, but you can still be bearish right now for, you know, a two year down cycle, which is the so what I just described, that's kind of where I'm at, is that I'm a believer in crypto as an asset class and as a technology and blockchain as a technology. But I think cyclically, you know, the way that the it's become very religious, um, it has a lot of echoes of 1999, in my opinion, um, you know, especially the Web3 stuff, which is very, very unproven and very early. If you look at the amount of um, investment and and uh, employment activity in Web3 versus the actual, you know, revenues, obviously, there's there's a pretty big mismatch. And there's always going to be at the early stage of a of of a new industry. But I think at, at this moment, that mismatch is gigantic. And then you have tightening Fed policy, which I think is going to be more aggressive than people think. Um, because, I mean, I think it's just hard to appreciate how insane this monetary policy cycle has been. It's like the, we've just gone through the greatest monetary policy experiment in history, and it's about to unwind. So, you know, if you just saw what that experiment did to risky assets, what do you think it's going to do on the other side? Probably a lot is my opinion. And then even looking inside, like internally into like the Bitcoin halving cycles, we're in the worst part of the halving cycle right now um, where Bitcoin tends to underperform anyways. And then there's so many markers. I mean, like I could list 20 of them if, if you wanted it, but it'll get boring. But the stadium stadium naming is, is a big marker. Um, so in 1999, it was fashionable for companies to add .com to their name, um, and the stock would go up 25% or whatever. So to me, crypto.com, um, you know, the the Staples Center being renamed crypto.com center, and then the coin, which people don't seem to have a good handle on what the use case is for that token, going from whatever 10 cents to 80 cents. You know, that's a marker. Um, and then the other marker is in general on Wall Street, um, there tends to be a large build after a long bull market. So if emerging markets rally for four years, you'll see investment banks making big hires and, and building out their their EM desks. Um, and it's kind of like a joke on Wall Street that it's, you know, that the worst possible time is when the most investment goes in. And it's just kind of human nature, right? Like when a, when an asset class isn't popular, you're not going to be able to to invest in it. It's just unfortunately that's the way that the capitalism kind of works is that it's pro cyclical. And so the amount of so let me just take a step back. In 1718, a lot of um, more like on the cutting edge kind of people that I know were going from traditional finance into crypto. Um, and that was probably like a, a decent sign. That was like 17, 18. So kind of before the winter, during the winter. Um, and that was probably a bullish sign that, you know, like smart, innovative people are heading to crypto um, when it's down, when it's down and out. Now, there's a lot more people going from traditional finance um, to to crypto that are more in like the the pick and shovel mm -hmm. area, less innovative, you know, like research, back office, middle office, uh, risk management, those kind of roles. Um, and to me, that feels like the classic build out at the top. So, I mean, there's a lot of indicators. Um, but I mean, to me, the real driver of the whole story, which most people were saying who were bullish, was MMT and crazy Fed policy or what's driving, and, you know, and that made sense. And now those things are done. And so now you got to have a pullback. And then so I was saying to you before the top of the show that I do think, though, that the next Fed easing cycle, probably crypto, you know, the real real crypto goes to all time highs. So like probably 99 percent of the altcoins go to zero. But in, you know, when whenever we're in the next Fed easing cycle, my guess is that Bitcoin's probably making new all time highs at that time. But. Certainly, that's not a trade for right now, in my opinion. We have a plenty more downside. Um, so the Fed hasn't even started hiking. Yeah, I, I, so I, I'm, I'm sympathetic to that view. I think, um, first, I actually am, am maybe more cautious than you are about whether the Fed is going to end up hiking, right? Um, 
or at least as aggressively as the market is pricing in. Um, so I, I think that's actually a great point for us to have a few dis a few um, minutes of discussion on. But I broadly agree with you. I just, you know, to me, Bitcoin um, is a particular area of focus where I think the, the very simple math behind the idea of it becoming the world's reserve currency um, does not function properly, right? So I actually think it is a bad or poor system um, for those outcomes, which is which is the driver of my hesitancy. But as you know, I, like I've shared stuff with you that says the odds are actually very high that what you're referring to is correct, right? That the price of Bitcoin could go quite a bit higher. I think the concern that I'm seeing is as the price has gone higher, we're not seeing any real evidence of fundamental use demand other than the speculative store of value, right? Mm -hmm. So that shakeout seems like it's approaching. Um, Let's take a step back and, and talk about this dynamic of the Fed easing cycle, transitioning to a Fed tightening cycle. And also, I'd love to, to get your thoughts on the fiscal dynamics as well, right? Because that's really what's been so dramatically different this cycle, has been the extraordinary degree of fiscal support, particularly for the lower income class that is spurred, you know, effectively excess demand for products like meat and cheese and everything else, as well as, you know, ATVs and, and snowmobiles and, um, you know, rental vehicles, et cetera. Um, when you think about 2022 and into 2023, how are you offsetting or how are you thinking about the combination of those two? First, as it relates to the absolute monetary and fiscal policy. And then let's talk a little bit about how you think that impacts the FX space, particularly G10, since that's an area of focus for you. Sure. So, I mean, the market is pricing, you know, some quick, quick Fed hikes and then pretty much nothing after that or cuts. So, like, there's inversion in most parts of the curve as the I think the standard thesis, which probably makes the most sense, is that they they kind of learned from last time that the capacity to absorb hikes is pretty low and that, um, you know, with the gigantic debt comes gigantic debt servicing costs if rates go up. So that puts a ceiling on rates. But the thing that I think, I don't know, I, the thing that I think is is not well, maybe it's well understood or it's, it's not discussed enough, is that the Fed put has always existed at around a 20% drawdown and that maybe that's not quite as easy this time, um, depending on how sticky inflation is. So if you get a 15% drop in stocks, let's say, and CPI is still around four and a half, five percent 5%, and maybe that's impossible. I think a lot of people would say that's impossible, that oil will just drop and everything will come back off. Um, but I think that the inflation this time um, is so poorly understood that that's not an absolute guarantee. So you have the combination of fiscal um, and then so now we're going to get into like a fiscal drag scenario. It's a fairly significant, fairly significant fiscal drag that we're looking at, particularly as it relates to income support for those who are either unemployed um, or those who um, might be staying at home, um, you know, no longer receiving any dramatic increase. You know, one of the things that I think has been really interesting is the explosive growth. It's actually just just highlighted by Daniel DiMartino Booth in her um, one of her, her recent pieces. The extraordinary explosion of the support in things like the SNAP program, which is increased 30 percent a year ago or 40 percent a year ago and now went up another 25 percent this year. We've basically gone, as I understand it, from something like one hundred and ninety five dollars to five hundred and fifty dollars worth of support, plus an additional five fifty associated with the child tax credit. Like you're now talking about extraordinary forms of effectively basic income that have flowed to the, the most importantly, the lowest income strata. Mm -hmm. So that is definitely a drag. And I, I mean, that's why I, my view is probably that the market's about right. But I think in the short run, you're going to see so much pressure on the Fed to just at least maintain credibility because they're on the brink of losing credibility on inflation yep. that you're going to have to see something that's probably more aggressive in the very front end. And then, you know, whether that ends up being a mistake because of the fiscal drag and the, and the base effects and inflation and everything, I think that's a pretty, there's a pretty decent chance of that. But again, like I said, I don't feel like any forecast is like, 
the base case can be what what I think you're getting at and we'll, what I think makes sense, which is things cool off in 2022. But I can tell you that most people thought that a lot of that stuff would have been happening by now because the end of benefits and um, and all that. And yet the consumer and businesses, uh, consumer and business balance sheets are so strong that you're not noticing the fiscal pullback so far, although it gets much more dramatic as time goes on. So let's see. Um, but I think one real eye opening part of all this, and I mean, this was true even like in 09 and 10, 2010, is that people have no idea where inflation comes from. So, you know, we thought QE was going to be inflationary. It wasn't. People thought that the fiscal was going to be inflationary. Maybe it was, but maybe it wasn't. Maybe it's supply chains. Um, it's very hard to say. And we keep pinning it on a lot of idiosyncratic factors like, um, you know, energy prices for a while. Then it was lump or it was lumber first and energy prices. Then it was auto prices. Now it's rent. Um, that's not really idiosyncratic when it's just a rolling series of, of things that are going up. So I, I feel like, I think in general, I always try to keep an open mind anyways, but I think there's never been a time where it's been more important to keep an open mind. Cause I, I do think there's a possibility that the consumer and businesses and the pickup in China just offsets the fiscal and things are just still raging in Q2 of 2022. I think that's like a reasonable um, outlook as well. And so the question is, you know, in the most in the most dire rolling over circumstance, the Fed could hike too much right away. But if things keep staying perky and, you know, you're still at 4.6 inflation in April of 2022 and we're still like not even close to neutral, barely finishing tapering, I still think there's even despite what's priced in, there's still scenarios where the Fed could hike more uh, in 2022 than what's priced. And now I know there's a, there are people that think this is like 2018 all over again, and and there's no you know that they'll end up hiking a couple of times and then cutting, but I don't know if it I'm not sure that it's that obvious. Yeah, I, I'm I'm willing to suspend my judgment on it as well. I I tend to think that they're too aggressive for 2022, um, what's priced into the market, but that's an opinion rather than certainly anything that that, that you could you know take to the bank. When you think about um, the implications of those two scenarios, right, the idea that the fiscal drag, et cetera, is going to result in a slowing in 2022, and the risk that the Fed is required to do at least one hike under the rubric of, um, you know, under the rubric of we have to maintain our credibility given the level of inflation that we've seen, how does that play out in G10 FX in your mind? So that's been a really big challenge in, in G10 is generally the biggest driver historically in, in my career of, of G10 FX is interest rate differentials. But if you have, in which you had in March 2020, every single central bank in the world cutting to zero and you know cr massively expanding their balance sheet, then which one do you pick? And no one really knew which one to pick. And, and so you ended up with mostly a lot of noise or like standard risk aversion, which was buying dollars in March 2020, and then slow unwind of, of that liquidity event, which is kind of what was the major theme. Um, so now you have to start looking for who's gonna who who has a chance of normalizing and who doesn't, and then how much. So in a world where inflation remains high and and this global economy is strong. Generally, the U.S. is viewed as one of the fastest hikers other than Canada and New Zealand. So you kind of end up bucketing the currencies as the hikers or the non-hikers. So the non-hikers would be ECB and, and BOJ are the two main ones. And then you kind of have this continuum of more aggressive hikers. And when things look good, the hikers do well. And uh, when the shit hits the fan, uh, if I can say that on this. Uh, yeah, you can. Okay. You said twice even the shit hit the fan. Now go ahead. Right. So um, when that happens, then the hikers sell off because then there, there's essentially two camps, which is one, which it sounds like you're in a little bit more, is we're going to eventually go back to secular stagnation because demographics are bad and debt is very large, and this is an aberration, and and we're eventually, and that's kind of I think that's kind of what the market's priced for is like a couple of like we have to hike, so we're going to hike type of hikes, but not really a true hiking cycle. And then the other camp, which I think is smaller, is 
that the secular stagnation was a trend that went on for 30 years. And maybe it was spurred by not just by demographics and, and rising debt, but maybe also by globalization and, um, you know, the, and a few other things which are and, and labor force issues, which are no longer true. And that's over. And now we've kind of turned some kind of corner. Um, to me, the demographics and debt arguments hold a lot more sway. Um, but I do think there is that chance that, you know, that it, and so if you end up with real actual hiking cycles, that will be strong dollars, strong Canada, um, essentially the cyclical, more, more cyclical countries, um, will outperform and then Euro against those currencies will, will fare very poorly. Um, and that would also be bad for, for crypto as well. So. I think part of the reason that crypto hasn't really dumped all that much yet is that there is kind of this hope that maybe the Fed is stopped out of their transitory call at the worst possible time um, and things are about to roll over. And there are many um, similarities to 2018, I think, yep. um, in terms of like the aggressiveness of the Fed turning and then the point in the cycle was kind of similar. Now, obviously, they haven't even hiked now. In 2018, there had already been many hikes. Um, but if you look at the curves, they kind of, it kind of feels the same. So a lot of people are banking on this as being a very shallow rate hike cycle. Um, and that will be the difference in, in G10FX will be if it is a shallow cycle, um, then the dollar probably doesn't go much higher. But if it's a legitimate you know, normalization cycle, then you're going to see a lot stronger dollar probably and a lot stronger Canada. And, and then, you know, the currencies that are going to be, or the countries that are going to be hiking a lot as well, like New Zealand will also do well. Um, and then if not, you end up with this big mean reversion trade where dollar sells off and everything kind of goes back to the zero lower bound and nothing's really happening in monetary policy and low volatility. Um, so that's been one of the interesting things in, in G10 FX has been, the fall in rates and the, and the lack of differential between countries has really hurt uh, volatility. And now you've really seen a big rebound in volatility because there's a lot of dispersion. You know, ECB could, could never hike in this whole cycle and Fed could hike six times in 2022 is, you know, those are kind of extremes of, of what could happen. And that's why you've been seeing Euro fall um, pretty significantly. Well, I, so it's, it's fantastic that you made that transition into the vol space, right? Because as we move from the discussion of the delta ones on the currencies, right, the outrights to the dynamics of the uncertainty around it, right, that has to be reflected in the implied volatility. And we have started to see that tick up. But unlike equity vol, for example, where we saw, you know, the, the VIX sitting at 34 in the, in, in the past couple of weeks, even as equity markets were within a whisker of their all time highs, right? Um, We've broadly seen very little response in equity volatility. I mean, euro is currently, I think it's yeah, 6.2 or something, right? And the other ones that interest me are the ones that effectively play to the deglobalization dynamic that could cause that break, right? So if I look at some of the pegged currencies, the USD SAR or the USD HKD, those vols are sitting near all-time lows. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are as it relates to the FX vol market, is this an area that you would look to to hedge equity exposure, for example? I think that's a good idea. So one interesting thing that I found, so I trade a lot of vol, um, but not as a volatility trader, just as a as a speculator saying, yep. you know, directional. But there's only certain regimes that where you can really make money buying vol. And that generally is when vol is relatively low and rising. So when vol is low and it's and it's doing nothing, usually that's just symptomatic of nothing's going on. Um, but one thing I find is that because a lot of models use um, use realized and like what actual volatility has been through some look back, say they'll look back one year or something, um, that if you feel as a human being that you can recognize that there's been a regime shift, generally volatility will be slow to react to that regime shift. So. I would say that that's what's happening now is we're, we're transitioning from everyone's at zero and no one's going to move rates regime to a lot of dispersion in rates. Um, 
and it just takes a really long time for the, for it to feed through. So to me, this is a great time to buy volatility. And you know, as people use definitely use FX vol as an equity hedge. Um, you know, the yen crosses, for example, tend to have high correlation, especially these days. People use Canada yen because. There's a terms of trade aspect with oil, where oil going up is good for Canada and it's bad for Japan. Yep. Um, so people you tend to use Canada yen or, or Aussie yen as proxies for for equities, and they're they're pretty good proxies. I mean, they they do work pretty well as hedges. And like I said, when you see FX ball breaking out, but it's not crazy high, to me that's actually the perfect time to buy it. Um, so I, I like expressing FX views or even equities views. Um, through through FX and and through FX options. Yeah, I, I, so I, I would highlight that I'm particularly drawn to the FX options. I'm concerned about relationships like the traditional CAD uh, JPY, right? CAD Yen, um, in particular because if one of the proximate events is a deglobalization dynamic associated with the Asia Pacific region. I would expect that Japan might behave differently than it has historically, right? So, so yeah, there are definitely regimes where that that's true. I feel like so like I started trading dollar yen in whatever 1996 and I do feel like people are always waiting for that like correlation break and it never really really happens. Like it happens sometimes for a bit like when China devalued in 2015. Um, you know, that was a risk negative event, which normally would mean dollar yen down, but dollar yen went up for a while because CNH was devaluing so rapidly that people were just buying dollars against everything, but it wasn't persistent. So I feel like, um, personally betting on that correlation break is, is generally just not the way I like, I would rather, if, if you think there's going to be an event in some other sector or whatever, you're better off playing that sector or stick to the traditional expected correlations, even though they're not perfect, obviously, um, because I feel like it's just very difficult to to identify time and then ride and then get out at the right time if you're doing something that's that's contrary to the to the dominant correlation. Um, and there's definitely been a lot of interest in the Chinese currency because it hasn't done what people would expect. It's been absolutely ripping. So the way that people normally look at it to strip out because it doesn't move that much to strip out the what's going on in the dollar is people look at the basket, um, mm -hmm. which is called the CFETs. And so the 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 yuan has been performing extremely well. Um, so that's been creating a lot of head scratching. Um, and a part of it seems to be a policy choice by China to help with inflation. Um, and part of it is inflows into the bond market because there's been it's been one of the best carry trades has been to be long China. Um, but that's always like one that people are watching for some kind of potential global blow up or, or, or deglobalization. However, the thing is, if you were playing that, obviously it didn't work for the reasons I described, but also because China has been importing an absolute cartload of goods, of course. So the sure there's been some kind of like deglobalization, de but you know, the, the mercantilist model or whatever you want to call it um, has still been doing pretty well through COVID because you know, demand has switched from services to goods. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I, I, and also the thing with the deglobalization too, I think is that to me, it's, it's one of those super structural trends that's very hard to, to, to really invest or trade um, because it's kind of like happening in all these different bits, spits and, and bits and bursts. Um, it's, I don't know, to me, it, it's a, that's a tough one to trade. So you, you highlighted this idea that the Fed could hike up to six times next year, right? Currently, we're pricing in somewhere in the neighborhood of two, two and a half, although today has backed some of that off a little bit. Um, what would be the scenario where you could see the Fed hike six times. So you're referring to going to 150 on Fed funds, for example. Right. So there's if you start with March, which would be the first possible time they could hike, there's seven meetings and you assume they wouldn't go 50. So that's like the absolute mathematical limit in my mind would be 175 basis points. So 150 is a lot, like just to be clear. Um, I think the scenario is is just that simply CPI doesn't come back off because OER is strong. I mean, 
I don't know if anyone living outside the U.S. can appreciate how strong the labor market is here. It's absolutely insane. Like there were times in the summer where I was away and restaurants were closed because they couldn't get enough staff. Um, I mean, there's hundreds of examples of, you know, because of the great resignation and all that. So if you have, you know, let's say unemployment on at 3.7 and CPI at or core PCE at 4.2 in May, you know, then that and those those numbers tend to be lagging numbers, too. So if they're up that high in May, they're probably going to take a while to come off still then. And the Fed's still under a lot of political pressure. I could see them just hiking. You know, they hike in March and then they hike in at every meeting from June to the end of the year. Um, but that would be essentially like an absolutely booming U.S. economy that doesn't respond and I mean, I don't think that's crazy, just given like, you know, long and variable lags of monetary policy and the 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 egregiously, you know, accommodative policy. I mean, they're still buying mortgage backed securities in what looks like a housing bubble, pretty much. Um, so, like, I think the normal whatever comps to 2018 and all that don't necessarily apply just because the starting points are so radically different. Right. Like we're used to all these cycles starting with inflation around two, two and a half percent. Um, and now we're at 6.8. Like, it's just not even, I mean, that's why I think the imagination is, is it c could be important. I mean, maybe it won't be important and we just kind of drift back to the, to the secular stagnation thing. But, um, you know, this has been sticky enough to that. It's confounded a lot of people, um, including the fed that I think now you can kind of say, well, maybe there's something different going on and maybe it's not all cyclical and maybe there's some structural stuff going on um, that's bigger than demographics for a while. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's actually a really interesting question. I mean, I, I, I'm looking right now on my screen at the uh, Euro dollar 2299s, right? Uh, the puts, and they're currently pricing 29 cents. Uh, they were as high as 34 a couple of days ago, right? 34 and a half, right? So like, that's basically creating the scenario that you're describing, right? That's, you know, uh, the, the put that would reflect give or take five or six hikes from the Fed. That feels like an opportunity to fade, in my view. Um, what's your reaction to something like that? So you're saying to fade the option pricing because it's, it's free money. money. So I, I don't think it's free money, but the, well, the, like it's it's a high EV, considering that the base case is so dramatically far away from that. Yes, I mean to me, it, and I'm not an expert in euro dollar options, but to no. me, it's probably a barbell kind of situation where, you know, it's either going to be one or the other, and there, there's probably not too much in between. So, like I think two hikes and five hikes are probably like the two scenarios, and so. You know, I think any any way that you can you can thread that needle is probably interesting. Um, I don't think there's like a ton of money to be made betting on one side or the other because I just think that like the the way that the curve is priced now looks like the the, the proper base case. Um, and then what you have to do is really just trade the inflation data because the Fed isn't really in control anymore, um, as you can see by the amount, like the, the speed of the pivot since June, the, the data is what's controlling the, the, the Fed. Um, it's kind of going data market Fed with the Fed being like the third, mm -hmm. like the least in control, in my opinion, at this point. So, you know, the second that you see some kind of mean reversion in CPI and PCE, that trade that you're describing is going to be epic, but I don't think you really need to do it now. Yeah, I, I think that's actually a reasonable point. I mean, to me, the the optimal time to do that sort of trade, you could you could dig into it, but the optimal time would be if you gain increased conviction that it is transitory and it'll recede, and the Fed hikes in March, right? Um, right, right. And you know. I mean, I think one big argument in your in that in favor of that trade or in your favor is the move in oil yeah um however like i remember thinking because i was more i was definitely in transitory camp I, I just thought it was like a temporary you know you reboot a computer or you reboot an economy there's a lot of weird stuff happens and then it kind of stabilizes and that was wrong 
And so that's probably coloring my thinking now. But I remember thinking like, oh, OK, lumber came back now. This is like this is over. And then, you know, this came this, like a lot of stuff peaked in May 2021. Right. A lot of commodities peaked in May 2021. And yet it just always is something else. It's whether it's OER or lumber or used cars. And I remember thinking the same thing about used cars. They were up, you know, looking at the Mannheim index. And then you see it pulling back and you're like, whew, thank goodness that's over. And then it just starts ripping again. And then energy in, the, in Europe, right? The same thing, that Dutch natural gas going nuts. Okay, that's over. That was like a freak show. And then now today we're making new all-time highs and some of that stuff. So the I guess the persistence of it has been so surprising that I don't – feel as, that, that the arguments that it won't be persistent are as convincing anymore because it just, you know, like what everyone was wrong on the transitory side for that long. I don't see why now they need to be right necessarily. Um, but I mean, you know, like I said, it, it, there are reasons, oil and fiscal probably being the two big reasons to think that maybe things do calm down in 2022. Yeah, I, from my perspective, I definitely feel the trade exhaustion starting to to wear on the team transitory, right? That they are, um, even as some of the dynamics that I would argue we should expect to play out in 2022 into 2023 begin to play out. And I think for me, the real test is going to be what happens to the, the backlog at the ports as we come into the January, February time period, right? If we right. don't get those ports cleared out in a way that is more than the window dressing that we've seen, then I'm a little mo more concerned about the, the team transitory argument. And actually one other thing to watch, which again, slightly leans towards the transitory or like, I think transitory that ship has sailed because it's not transitory, but whatever that it will mean revert at some point is that housing prices seem to have stabilized a little bit as well. Yeah. So I guess what you need is is some kind of dashboard that's relatively high frequency, um, like ports and, and housing and things like that. Um, and then, yeah, you just make your decision, okay, I'm going to pull the trigger now. And I think because of, you know, what the, the way that things have been so uncertain, I think there'll be time to do the trade. Um, as opposed to trying to like more like, I guess there's always the question of like forecasting or reacting. And I think there will be enough time to, to be kind of like have your forecast, but then have your markers and then you go, okay, I've hit enough of my markers. I'm going to now, you know, react. And, and it feels a bit less like a, because the risk is like, there's going to be a lot of people out there that just keep saying it's transitory. And of course, eventually they're going to be right, but that doesn't, make you you're not going to make money just saying it's transitory forever um that's like going back to our very first conversation about the the newsletter kind of idea where you know at some point you got to stop out or you got to be acting in the real world with real assets and real markets and to me that the the just sticking with transitory forever um isn't a good trading strategy although in 10-year bonds actually it's been pretty good <laughs> yeah i so I, it's interesting like i i look at tens and I, if anything i want to fade as i you know i want to fade the flattening of the curve at this point i, I want to bet on the steepening but my guess is is that takes the form of fewer hikes and um slightly better performance at the back end of the uh, you know or selling off of the back end effectively it really does feel to me like like there has not been a trade though for team transitory until very, very recently, right? And so that's been part of my critique of even my own positions on it, which is how are you going to make money off of this, right? Are you gonna step in front of oil? Are you going to bet on bonds? You know, my argument has been that bonds were better than people had anticipated for a variety of reasons, but now it does feel like the rate vol has picked up enough that the expectations for hikes, particularly in the United States, have picked up enough that you might want to actually start thinking about playing that trade. But it just, it, you know, right. a lot of people have been hurt in the macro community, in my view, from either trying to force a transitory trade that didn't exist or on the flip side of the equation, bet on a continued inflation that has failed to manifest itself in the ever steepening of the yield curve that I think people had anticipated. Well, that's the absolutely kind of mind blowing thing about this year is that, you know, we're talking about two diametrically opposed 
economic views. And it was really hard to make money in either of them in, in a lot of ways because – you know, there's a meme going around like I called seven percent inflation. What'd you do? I bought gold. You yeah, know, like right. there, there's been a lot of trades that that really didn't work out at all. Um, and so that's kind of been one of the the incredible things about like uh, gold is is one example, but there's there's other examples is that you really had to pick the correct expression. And to me, this whole cycle is just a massive indictment of gold as a as an inflation hedge, and it's substantiates the idea that you have like a very small sample size of the 1970s, which was coming off of like a, a you know, dislocation event in 1971. And so people are way too focused on that period as, as for gold as an inflation hedge and really gold is just like a risky asset with some, some strange properties, but it's, it's more of like a liquidity barometer with with strange qualities than than an inflation hedge um i mean i'm definitely not alone in saying that i think that's kind of where consensus is now um but i think it's been really interesting to to kind of test some of these assets against massive inflation and you had you know, the idea that we could have 6.8 percent inflation and and us 10 years at 141 um would be pretty much incomprehensible if someone told you that 12 months ago i think um it's just amazing how, you know, I mean, that, that's why, like, I think I say in one of my books, like, if it was easy, it wouldn't pay so well. Um, it's just things don't always work out. They, they, this doesn't always have to make sense. Um, and I think that's a, another argument for being nimble is that, you know, there's plenty of people that are still screaming about gold being long gold because of inflation. I'm like, dude, you got your biggest inflation in 40 years and gold hasn't done anything. So it's time to move on. So when, when you think about that dynamic of um, being flexible and being um, things not working out as people anticipate, another area that you and I have discussed recently is the similarities between what we're seeing today in both equities and in things like crypto to the dot-com cycle. Um, you mentioned the magazine indicator, the time person of the year for Elon Musk. And in 1999, the time person of the year was... It was Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos. Yeah. Who ultimately became the person I, I mean, we could make a legitimate argument that he became the person of the next two decades. Yeah. Um, but was very poorly timed in terms of the actual stock price performance, right? Because almost right. exactly on that day is when Amazon itself actually topped out in the markets. It had, had failed to perform in early 2000 in the same way that um, a lot of the other names did. Um, when you think about where we are in this cycle, how do you draw the link between those two? So I think there are a lot of similarities. Um, just to talk about the magazine cover indicator for a second in case people aren't familiar with that. So the idea is that if you look at mainstream magazines and there's um, a financial type of theme in a mainstream magazine, that means that that theme is very well known in the financial community and is probably fully invested. By the time you know, a mainstream journalist is talking about something, usually that means it's very late in the cycle. So that's the relevance of, of Elon Musk being on the front of time or Bezos being on the front of time is that whatever the, that person's you know, business is, which we know what their businesses are, they, if it's on the front cover of Time Magazine, that means you're very late in the cycle for that business um, generally or for people appreciating that business and investing in it. Um, and so I actually did a study one time. So The Economist isn't exactly mainstream, but it's it's not as financial as, say, something like Barron's is a lot more, more financial experts um, or a little bit less mainstream. But anyways, we did a study one time of every Economist uh, cover that had any kind of uh, cover that you could ascribe to a market. So if it was like a rocket taking off in Brazil, then that's bullish Brazil. You know, so strong directional um, content that potentially describes the direction of a market. And th the long story short is that it is very contrarian. It, it's not instantaneous necessarily, um, but within six months, about 65 or 70% of the markets that are featured on the front of The Economist magazine 
um, are are worse, or if it's a bearish article, like the famous one is the end of equities in Business Week, which was the yep. low in 1979, or five dollar oil in the Economist, which was the low in whatever year that was. Um, so it's anyways that it is true that when when a financial theme's on a magazine cover, it's contrarian, and that's empirically backed. Um, it's not just like a fun fact that is is not true. Um, and I think there's a lot of similarities to 1999. Uh, the biggest one I would say is like the religious fervor. So I worked in a day trading shop in 1999 through the whole bubble. And there were basically three types of people in there. There was the kind of like day traders who didn't really care, just wanted to make money, which was me. Um, and then there were the people who were like, this is a bubble and you know, this is BS and trying to be short and they all blew up. And then the third group was people that were religious about like B2B is going to change the world, man. Like JDS Uniphase is going to own the optical networks to rule the entire internet. This internet is going to be where everyone shops and stuff. Like basically the kind of religious fervor that you see around Web3. And people are not good at distinguishing good investments from good stories, from good companies, from good protocols and good platforms. So it's easy to see a good a good story um, and and recognize it right. Like Amazon wasn't bullshit. It, it was an incredible company, and the internet was incredible. It transformed. It was transformational. But yet, buying all those stocks was a disaster because the, you know a good story and a or a good stock um, are not the same thing. Uh, good and good, even great companies can be terrible investments, right? So. That's what happened there was there was a lot of bad companies, but there were a lot of great companies that were still bad investments. And my guess is that you're going to see the same thing in almost all of the altcoins where, you know, there's a lot of marketing, a lot of hype, a lot of re religious fervor. And in the end, you know, are the use cases there? Probably, yes, there are some use cases. Um, you know, the game GameFi is an area that I'm specifically interested in because I like to play a lot of video games and my kids play a lot of video games. Um, and I can tell you with a lot of certainty that the use case is nowhere near where the hype is. Like the games aren't very fun. It's impossible to on-ramp. Um, you know, 90% of the people playing Axie are doing it just to, as a pay to earn, as a like kind of quasi job in Philippines and, and countries like that. Um, so to me, the hype cycle and the reality are really, really disconnected. And that's exactly what 99 looked like. Um, and I think you need to kind of separate out like Bitcoin, like you said, to me, as a, as a payment system, it's super inefficient, very expensive to on-ramp and off-ramp. And, and it's not like a good way to pay um, in general, but it does seem like it has pretty good safe haven qualities. Um, you know, it's free to or positive yielding, whereas gold is you have to store and it's negative yielding. Um, so I, I personally think Bitcoin's in a different category because it's like the OG original first thing that will always be the, you know, the if if there's going to be a crypto that store value to me, that's going to be Bitcoin. And that will give Bitcoin the ultimate use case. Whereas if you look at like I recently wrote a piece about um, that, I, I looked at the top 15 altcoins every six months since 2013. And they basically just come in and out like you look at the, the, the charts of all these altcoins and most of them just look like mountains or a series of mountains. And those mountains correspond with the hype cycles. So people get really excited about Monero and Zcash or Peercoin or Litecoin. You know, I could go on for 20 minutes naming all the coins that, that were in the top 15 that are no longer in the top 15. And it, to me, most of that is, is hype and marketing. And, and it's also a lotto, lotto ticket mania, right? Like it's people that have FOMO that read about the Dogecoin millionaire in the newspaper and don't understand survivor bias, which is that you're only going to hear the winning stories. So the, the dude that put 40 grand into Shiba Unu at the top and lost 28 grand and he's never going to sell it and it's just going to sit in his account as SHIB goes to zero, that's never going to be in the newspaper. And that, those are the stories that are really like a lot of what's going on in behind the scenes. Yes, people are getting rich. But the people that are getting rich are the market makers um, and the, the the exchanges and the the people that get the initial drops of the coins. 
and mostly the rest of it is hype. And that was the same. The machine was different in 1999. Like in, in 99, it, the machine was like Henry Blodgett and Wall Street and all that. Um, and not to pin the blame on him. I mean, it just, you know. He was, he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Is yeah. The easiest way to put it. Yeah. I wouldn't, I, I'm not meaning to single him out as a bad dude. Just he was part of that whole zeitgeist, right? Yep. The zeitgeist came from Wall Street. And now the zeitgeist comes from VC backed, you know, token companies. Um, so overall, I guess to answer your question, there's a lot of parallels. The one thing, though, is that that's a very big difference, I think, is that crypto already had one winter. Um, so I don't think like I think that there's like a mini winter coming for crypto and I'm bearish, um, but I don't think the winter will probably be as bad because I don't think the Fed cycle will be all that dramatic. Um, and like I said, the next time Fed's cutting, I'm going to be long. You know, I'm going to be trying to anticipate that and be long Bitcoin. Um, but for now, I think we could go a lot lower. Yeah, so I mean, this is going to be an interesting point of differentiation. To me, Bitcoin is Alta Vista um, or MySpace or whatever. But um, I, I could be wrong on that, right? And um, I also agree with you that we likely have not seen the end of the crypto or what I refer to as the natively digital securities movement, right? I mean, this is the logic is so compelling and so clean that we need to move away from the traditional paper-based sources. We may talk about the fact that everything is digital or electronic today, but the reality is things like DTCC, et cetera, are still requiring a physical stock certificate to be held in a vault somewhere. You know, a uh, debt security has a physical paper back document that stands as the official document of record that needs to be referred to in the case of a bankruptcy or a corporate action event. Um, we're going to move away from that. I don't think there's any question around that. And I think that's also the interesting dynamic. If we just toss on pure option theory, right? So if we think about the dot-com cycle as in aggregate, it played out as being even more impactful than we could have imagined. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But because we can't price a security as having negative value right now, obviously, we've recently seen oil price that way. That's a derivative that has its own unique characteristics to it. Um, but we can't price an actual security with negative value. They all have to carry option value that they play through. Right. So the right. aggregate space has to be inflated by that dynamic. To me, that feels like a lot of what transpired in 1999, right? Yeah. I do think that there were particular dynamics around the flow of funds into index vehicles, the flow of funds into technology funds, et cetera, people chasing in the same way that we've seen this time around. But I agree with your overall observation that the space that this is very much a watch this space sort of dynamic, right? Um, I just happen to disagree with you on Bitcoin, but that you know that's between two traders. Um, when you think about what happens, what the Fed's reaction function is, right? You highlighted this idea that they may be more constrained. In your mind, does that create the end of the risk parity trades? No, because I don't think they're that constrained. I, like, I, I think in general that any drop, in, significant drop in risky assets will eventually be deflationary, but the lag just means that the Fed won't be reacting as quickly as they did in the past. So in the past, they could just, you know, if inflation's at 2.2 and risky assets drop 20%, you can be pretty confident that you're going to probably be at 1.9 pretty quick. But if you risky, if inflation's at 6.8 and risky assets drop 18%, you know, you might still be and you've just been beaten to death by all the politicians and kind of slapped into elevating inflation over jobs for the first time in a long time um, since 1980, probably, then I just don't think your reaction function is going to be quite as quick. So in the end, I, I think that it, the reaction or the, the cycles are not going to look all that different. But the reaction function is going to be slower on this cycle for the Fed. Like, right, normally what they do is they they ease extremely aggressively and then they tighten very slowly. And we're just seeing like a little bit of a difference here now because the pressure has become so significant, partly from the data, but also from, from the politics, that now they're going to have to normalize a little more quickly than they wanted to. 
Um, and then the subsequent easing cycle probably is a little bit slower than they want it than they'll want it to be as well. Yeah, I, I think I, I think there's actually a, a very strong argument to be made for that. Um, I, I'm not sure that we're yet at the point that we're going to see the permanent flip that we saw change in 1998. Right. So in 1998, the Fed, the relationship between treasuries and equities flipped from being negative to positive as the Fed moved from targeting inflation to targeting risk assets effectively, right? Trying to, to make sure that, that it didn't decline. What we haven't seen this time around is something that we actually did see in, um, in 2018, which is that correlation flipping negative briefly, right? Like we still right. have not seen that. It still feels very much like the relationship between rates and risk and, and equities is a risk off risk on sort of framework as compared to an inflationary dynamic that could be purely orthogonal. Right. And, and people have been trying to kind of make that argument um, that like bonds aren't a good hedge anymore. Yeah. And I guess there's a point where like at zero, you know, a zero 10 year yield, then there's probably a point where it becomes nonlinear and that's true. But yeah, I mean, I'm more with you that it's, there's still a decent risky asset hedge um, until further notice with, you know, there's been some blips, but, but I got to ask you, so if, if Bitcoin's Alta Vista, then what's Google or, or what's um, Explorer or, or, or Chrome? Yeah. So, so my, my quick answer is, is that it is likely a um, transaction based coin, which is what Bitcoin was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I'm skeptical of the store value type dynamics. To me, that's a speculative component. Um, and I don't necessarily believe that there has to be a replacement for gold, right? I actually think one of the ironies is, is, is that gold itself um, can fail outside of the, the purely limited quantity, right? I mean, we can print an unlimited quantity of dollars, and we may eventually do so, and therefore gold will go up in nominal terms. But the idea that we're going to return to a fixed exchange rate or a convertible exchange rate, to me, feels premature, right? By by you know, at least a decade. Um, so the, to me, the irony, I think, is, is is that what we'll see is a rise of a use case. And whether that's a Solano or a um, Ethereum, I, I'm very mixed, right? But those clearly have greater use components to them currently than Bitcoin does. Right. Um, so you're more on the transactional side than the store of value side. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, that, that at its core, that's what Bitcoin was designed for. Right. right? I mean, it was supposed to be a peer-to-peer -peer exchange. Transaction with, system, yeah. right? And it is broken down into this store of value story, which to me just reeks of speculation, right? right. Um, so that, that's that's where I fall out. But um, I, I do think that it is an area that will continue to grow in importance. And it's one that um, I would encourage people to do their homework on and recognize that when you want to be making the investment is when the sentiment has turned against it and everyone is convinced that everything is the dot-com cycle all over again, right? That, right. You know, there and is no value here. One interesting thing about crypto because of its frequency of crashes is that if you actually have a strong view in something and just throw in stupid bids, you actually have a decent chance if you're patient um, to, to get filled. You know, if you put a bid at 2100 in Ethereum, and just say, okay, that's kind of like where I'm comfortable because that's like a 50% retracement or whatever. Um, and then just forget about it. You know, it's not like non-zero that you get given, not necessarily on, on one individual super crash in one day, but, um, you know, just when you're dealing with assets that are this volatile, you your opportunities to get back in are probably meaningful. I, I, no, I actually love that strategy. I refer to those as ghosts in the machine, right? Mm -hmm. Effectively, that one day spike um, up or down effectively, where your outrageous bid or offer um, has value sitting out there. Right. Um, like the and, t shirt that says, uh, trade like your long gamma. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so I, I think that's a listen, I think that's a fantastic place to start. So so we're going to start our bidding on Ethereum at 2100. Um, <laughs> Bitcoin, I'll go with uh, five. Um, that's a joke, but not that's entirely, right. as you know. Um, uh, you, you and I had actually had an exchange where um, I had outlined kind of the way I'm thinking about it. And the correct trade is a 
you know, uh, 40,000 Bitcoin put that knocks in at 195,000 is uh, is basically the way it plays out. Um, Listen, Brent, this is fantastic. You mentioned that your product is available to retail. I know that you're on Twitter as Brent, it's Brent Donnelly FX, right? Is that? Uh, It's just Donnelly Brent. Donnelly Donnelly Brent, Brent. okay. Yeah. And your your, um, text expressing your much greater technical facility than mine is written upside down just so for the, for people trying to uh, to catch on. And you look much right. more like my character of Vecini than I do myself. So <laughs> at least you've opened your brain up to, uh, to, to alternative thoughts, right? Um, if people wanted to look into your retail product, your retail offerings, how would they do that? Um, so I write a daily called AMFX, um, and I've been writing that since 2004. And so I just started selling subscriptions to that in September. Like I said in the past, it was always only institutions. And they can go to spectramarkets.com um, and everything's on there. Spectra Fantastic. with an A. And, and then the two books, which both of which I highly recommend, are The Art of Currency Trading, um, which came out in 2019. And is, as you point out, a little bit more um, subjective than some of the the purely technical components but reflects the wisdom that's accumulated over 25 plus years of trading fx and then your most recent one is um uh alpha trading which is a broader uh discussion around it lots of individual stories feels more to me like a jack swagger sort of you know here are a series of things or a michael lewis narrative component than um a pure trading book does that yeah i true? mean those are two two writers that i look up to and I, I would say that's accurate so if people want to learn about fx trading specifically that's the first one and people that are just more interested in trading so it's the mindset methodology and psychology that kind of stuff of trading um, then alpha trader would be the one fantastic brent um, can we uh, make this a somewhat regular thing and, and sure. revisit it yeah, in a couple of months? Yeah. I would love that as well. Thank you very much, Brent. Awesome. Okay, thanks, Michael. Take care. Okay, cheers. We hope you enjoyed the video. At Real Vision, we help you understand the complex worlds of finance, business, and the global economy with in-depth analysis from real experts. Join the revolution at realvision.com.